Okay, Justin Ramundo, our next speaker, is editorial director of antiwar.com, which is the premier anti-war uh, website uh, on the internet. It's, it's the website that we go to every single morning. Uh, there is no better website and hasn't been for many years that has as much information. <laughs> information, commentary, insights, blogs, everything. It's just fantastic. Uh, Justin himself writes one of the most informative and entertaining columns on politics, foreign policies, and civil liberties. It's one of those columns where you don't quite know what you're going to get, which makes it very exciting and stimulating. Uh, the column's entitled Behind the Headlines. I think he writes three times a week a uh, lengthy commentary on, on what's going on. He is the author of An Enemy of the State, The Life of Murray and Rothbard, and Reclaiming the American Right. The Lost Legacy of the Conservative Movement, which is an intellectual history of the pre-World War II conservative anti-imperialist tradition. The title of Justin's talk is The Future of Libertarianism. Justin Raimondo. My, my topic today, the future of libertarianism, cannot be broached without reference to libertarianism's long and storied past. And so I hope you'll forgive this extensive prelude before I get to the main topic. Now, from the very beginning, the laissez-faire movement was beset by a thrilling but utterly mistaken idea that progress toward liberty is inevitable, a long, slow, steady process that coincides with the march of modernity. The rise of the movement for personal liberty and economic freedom was coincident with the growth and development of industrial civilization. As the standard of living rose, so did the advocates of laissez-faire gain intellectual and political traction. Yet, None of this was inevitable. At, at any point, the society of status, as Murray Rothbard dubbed it in his seminal essay, Left and Right, The Prospects for Liberty, could have returned. The old order, with its absolute monarchs and feudal barons, its downtrodden serfs and strictly hierarchical organization, could have made a comeback. And indeed, 200 years later, the old order did return to Europe as Hitler and Stalin tried to drag a continent back to the Dark Ages and nearly succeeded in doing so. In a series of revolutions that rocked Europe and much of the world, laissez-faire liberalism overthrew the old order. And yet, as Rothbard pointed out, there was a fatal flaw in the classical liberalism of, of, of the 19th century. An inner rot, as he put it, that ate away at the ideological core of libertarianism, even as the movement began to achieve some of its goals. That flaw was made manifest in, in the abandonment of natural rights philosophy and a strategic timidity. One seemed to follow from the other that reverted to a defense of the status quo. Secondly, liberalism was lulled to sleep with a seductive lure of evolutionism, the doctrine of social Darwinism, which saw history as an ever ascending spiral of progress. According to this theory, the triumph of liberty is inevitable because reason, science, and enlightened thinking are on our side. Well, the history of the 20th century would soon refute this, but at the time, it seemed almost reasonable. After all, society was progressing. Peoples were freeing themselves from the yoke of feudalism and mercantilism, and it looked, if only for a moment, that the cause of liberty might triumph, however long it took. This Pollyannaism was swept aside with the advent of the 20th century and the rise of the totalitarian ideologies, liberalism's darkest hour. Yet, as proof 
that no error is ever finally refuted. We see its echo today in the abstruse theories of certain beltway deep thinkers who seem to believe that just because they're getting richer, so is everybody else. And that rising income means the increase of freedom. But, but of course, the, the business cycle is alive and well, thanks to the persistence of fiat money and central banks, as we are beginning to rediscover. Also raising its ugly head is the specter of constant warfare, the favorite pastime of empires, and this too threatens our liberties as well as our lives. If the 19th century saw the rise of a worldwide movement toward liberty, the 20th saw the progress that had been made repealed and the clock turned back. In the world of ideas, political absolutism ruled the day, and all around the world, the inevitability of socialism was simply assumed. In the US, the Great Depression brought about the utter collapse of the old Spencerian illusion that liberty would triumph simply on account of some mechanism inherent in the nature of things. Two world wars shattered the fragile shell of constitutional government in America and opened the door to the demise of our old republic. The 100-day revolution of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his brain trust and the Second World War effectively repealed the American Revolution and set in motion a process of statification that is today reaching its climax. The remnants of classical liberalism went virtually underground at this point. The tides of public and intellectual opinion were, were running so heavily against them that their ideas were not even considered. The old time liberals, such as John T. Flynn, were simply out of the running and were denounced as hopeless reactionaries along with H.L. Mencken and Albert J. Nock, to take two prominent examples. Park Avenue Bolsheviks, such as James Burnham, were confidently, pro confidently proclaiming the demise of capitalism and the rise of the so-called managerial class of bureaucrats and steely-eyed men in spectacles who would soon put society to rights. Socialism, Leninism, fascism, and all sorts of idiosyncratic social movements and sects sprang up like mushrooms after a heavy rain as the Great Depression wreaked havoc with people's lives. Arrayed against these overwhelming currents, a valiant band of counter-revolutionaries fought a heroic rearguard action. A disparate lot, they were united only in their common reaction against that man in the White House, as, as they disdainfully referred to FDR. They opposed the state worship and centralism that was dominant in academia, the world of letters and politics, albeit from a wide variety of political and cultural stances. They were populist progressives, such as Senator Burton K. Wheeler, who resisted the president's court packing scheme and turned against the New Deal, as well as Midwestern Republican isolationists, so-called, who resisted the drive to war. From H.L. Mencken, the, that celebrated man of letters who was considered a radical in the 1920s and denounced as a reactionary a decade later, to Henry Regnery, a Midwestern businessman who had found the first conservative publishing house in America, the America Firsters spanned the cultural and political spectrum. These were the men and women of the old right, such long forgotten figures as Flynn, Garrett Garrett, Colonel Robert Rutherford McCormick, publisher of the heroic Chicago Tribune, Isabel Patterson, Rose Wilder Lane, and such organizations as the American Liberty League, the Committee for Constitutional Government, and most importantly, the America First Committee, the biggest anti-war organization in American history.